So we'll continue on our with our explainability session with a talk by Gabriel Laberge, who's PhD student at Polytechnique Montreal under the supervision of Foutsecom and Mario Marchand. And um, he will talk about uh, hybrid models, uh, exploring so in exploring the trade-off between transparency and performance. Okay, so hi everyone. You have probably uh, seen those figures uh, previously, like in some papers, where we show as a two axes uh, the interpretability and the accuracy of a model. And there are some scatter points uh, that represent different types of models. And we, as we always assume that simple models such as linear regression or rule-based models they have lesser performance and black box models such as random forests and, and, and uh, neural networks, they have more performance but less interpretable. And this seems to be true in practi practice, but the issue with these plots, and they're we see them very often, like that's another, e another example that we see uh, in a DARPA um, document, and uh, another example here, is that, well, how do you measure interpretability? Like, it seems like the value that are shown here are arbitrary, it's just to convey the intuition that there's a trade-off, but we don't measure a number, it's just a, an intuition. But now I'm asking some questions, does this trade-off exist? And if it does exist, can we quantitatively measure it? Or even optimize it? And the answer to those questions is yes. Um, this is going to be the topic of this talk. So the presentation is structured as follows. I'll introduce the hybrid interpretable models, which allow us to ex explore the trade-off between these two, uh, the, the measures of accuracy and transparency. Afterwards, I'll discuss the general taxonomy and the current methods that are proposed to learn such models. We'll discuss the limitations of those approaches and the motivation for a new method that we developed. And we'll conclude shortly after. So basically, uh, interpretable, uh, hybrid interpretable model is just a model where given a query X, you have a gating mechanism that decides, should I send this input to a simple model called the HS, or should I send it to a complex model, HC. And why would we want to have such a model? The intuition is that there may exist a region, omega, where the problem is simpler than the rest. And just, this is, it's not a real data set, it's just um, a toy example in 2D where you want to predict colors. And let's say that round truth has a checkerboard pattern to it. You could try to predict the value at each of these squares and, but what you see is that in the center region, the resolution of the ground truth is actually larger than the, res the resolution of the, like the different squares. And you could say, well, could I just reduce the, res the resolution of my model on those points? So I could simplify the model where the, the task is simpler, but keep the complexity around it. Another example is, uh, let's say you're a patient that goes to the hospital for triage and they're going to look at your symptoms and they may decide, okay, are these common symptoms or not? If they are common, then you might be able to infer the disease with simple rules, such as if you have a fever and you cough, then you may have COVID. Or if you're a tourist and you have diarrhea, then you might have tourista. Otherwise, it might be benign uh, cases. So these are some things, and we do it all the time when we have common things that we, uh, we develop rules based on common observations that we make. But in re rare instances where it's very hard for, for us to make decisions. In that case, we would uh, send the patient to a specialist. And a specialist in me medicine could be treated as a black box because we don't know everything that happens in the mind of the, of the doctor, uh, especially the patient doesn't know uh, what happens in their mind. So this is the main definition of a hybrid model. Now we'll go through some uh, uh, notation. We have X, the input space, and we have H, C, and H, S, the sets of simple and complex classifiers, and here it's binary classifiers. And a model, a hybrid model, is going to be a triplet. So you have the simple model, the complex model, and the, the region omega. And, and it creates a function that if X is in the region, then you send it to HS. If it's not, then it, you send it to H, uh, the complex model. And here the key quantity that we're going to study is the so-called transparency. That is the probability that from your data generating mechanism, the input is sent to the uh, sample model. So it's, if it's 50%, then half of the patients in your hospital are easily uh, classified, and the rest is sent to a, 
to doctors and experts. And okay, that's good, but how do we train such models? Intuitively, it must be very hard because we have three components. We have two models to train, and also we need to define the notion of region where one model operates. And uh, we're, we're going to have three also uh, um, things that we desire from this procedure. First of all, we want to be black box agnostic because there are many existing uh, APIs for fitting black boxes, such as scikit-learn and XGBoost, and we don't want to play too much with those. We want to be able to use the API to train the black box, and we don't want to play in the internals of the code, and this will make the method very versatile for, uh, for our users. Also, we want to be able to control the transparency. So if I want to, let's say I want at least 50% of transpa transparency, I need a learning algorithm that gives me this guarantee. And also, I want to be able to say, well, given that a, tra a constraints on trans transparency, I want to be able to get the most accurate model because we are interested in exploring the trade-off between accuracy and transparency. So we're, we're trying to find the Pareto front of the, two, of the two quantities. And to explore this front, we really need optimality because otherwise our conclusions may be biased by suboptimality. Some more notation, we have a data set of sampled uh, input and outputs uh, from the distribution. And we have the error rate here. And we're going to approximate the transparency using the ratio of instances in the data that land in the region. They've added by all the instances in the data. So it's just an empirical estimate of the expectancy we saw earlier. And we're going to minimize this general form of the objective function where we have three terms. We have the error rate of the overall model. We have a complexity for the simple class that we, uh, that we penalize. And we don't include the complex class because we don't want to play too much with the learning algorithm that involves this complex model. We just want to use a point fit method from an API. And the, the last term is the untransparency, so it's the, like the reverse of the transparency where we penalize the more points are sent to the black box rather than the uh, transparent model. But, but even given this objective, we, had, we, we, th we found two ways to train them. First, the first one is called post black box, where what you do is that you first train a black box, or it could even be a black box that you have already trained and saved on the computer for a long time. And afterwards, you're going to add on top of it the region and the interpretable model. So it's sort of like we're adding uh, like a, a, a new layer to the model that's going to simplify it in a certain region. The other paradigm is the pre-black box uh, method where you start by finding the region and the interpretable model. So we tr you try to find the region in your problem when, where it's simpler. And once you find this region, afterwards you fit the black box. And what we do is that since the black box is only going to op operate outside of omega, we can upweight those samples to make sure that the model performs better where it's going to operate. But we don't want to remove all the samples because black boxes are very data hungry. So we prefer to provide the whole data set, but to s apply uh, non-uniform weighting to the instances. So this is the general taxonomy. We have defined hybrid models and uh, the pre-black box and post-black box approaches. Another approach would be to train the two simultaneously, the complex and simple models. But again, this breaks our idea of black box agnostic agnosticism. So we're going to stay with the pre-black box and post-black box uh, paradigm. The last thing we need to define is how do we define those regions? And it's going to be very critical for the algorithm. We could use uh, axis aligned rectangle, like all the pictures I show. We could use a ball around the point. We could use linear half spaces to define the region, or we could use rules, which would be logical statements on the input. And if you have a rule such as this one, the region, which we label omega r, would be all the instances in input space that satisfy the rule. And we're actually going to use this approach for a very sp simple reason, that a rule defines a region where uh, it's, it's satisfied, but you can also predict on that uh, if you have multiple rules, you can do decision uh, rule sets or rule lists where you also use those rules to make predictions. So in a sense, a rule acts as both the omega and the simple model. So it sort of reduces the parameterization that we need. So now instead of a triplet, we have a, uh, a tuple where we have the complex model and the, ru uh, the rule. And it would look like this. So you would start if my first rule is true, then I would predict something. If, if, if not, then I look at the second rule. If it's true, I predict something else or and then finally, if none of these rules apply, then we don't land, we're not covered by the rules and we land to the black box. So it's really just, you, you can see this as, the black box as being the by default prediction of a, uh, a, of a rule list. In that case, the objective, we rewrite it with the tuple 
So we have again the error of the tuple and the, the misclassification rate. And now the penalty is going to be the length of the rules or the number of rules that we use. And we also have the untransparency term here that, uh, that penalizes sending too many instances to the black box. Now we're going to discuss two methods that, are, that have already been proposed to learn these models. The first one is called hybrid rule set. And it works as follows. It, it uh, follows the post black box paradigm. So we, fr we start with a pre-trained black box. It may, you may already have it, uh, but you want to improve it. So now what you do is that you're going to find two sets of rules, positive and negative rules. And if you satisfy the positive rule, then you predict one. Else, if you satisfy the negative one, you predict zero. And if you satisfy neither, then you go send to the black box. And the way you find these rules is uh, with a, uh, a local search algorithm uh, simulated annealing that is going to perturbate. You start with a random subset of rules and you add some, you do some random uh, modifications to those and you keep, after a certain amount of time, you keep the one that give you the best uh, empirical error. But the, but the issue with this method is that it's stochastic. It uses stochasticity as a way to explore the, sp the space of, like the exponential space of rules. But as a result, if you run your code twice, then you might have very different models. And what we see here is that we vary the beta parameter, which allows you to control the transparency. Uh, actually, the higher the beta, the higher you expect the transparency, which we see, but there's no like perfect monotonic relation because there is noise in the reruns of the same code. Then you can hardly consistently get the same transparency. And as a reminder, that was one of our criteria is to be able to say, okay, I want 50% transparency. I need a method that gives me this consistently. And it's not the case for a hybrid rule set on the compass data set. And also, uh, even worse, on adult, we're not even able to get uh, models that have a 25% uh, transparency. It's like there's this jump due to, uh, to the stochasticity and the instability of the learning method. The other proposal that, that was uh, advanced as an uh, improvement to hybrid rule set is called companion rule list. And it's also post black box, so you start with your black box pre-trained that you already have. And now we're going to have a list of rules, so you consider the order of the rules. And the key observation of this approach is that if you have three rules, then you actually n have not one, but three hybrid models. The first one is you have all the rules and at the end you predict with the black box. The second model is that you remove the last rule and then you keep the first two rules and you have the black box at the bottom and then you remove the second rule and you keep, uh, you have this one here. So just that with three rules, you have multiple models and these models have different accuracies and transparency. So you can explore more efficiently the space of trade-offs with a single run of your algorithm. So that's the premise of the approach, but still, uh, the algorithm that learns it is stochastic. It's also the simulated annealing method. And what we see here, I show the transparency as a horizontal axis, and each line is a run, and the points are the different models uh, that you get. And let's say for this data set, you want to reach 50% transparency. Then on half of the runs, you will need to go up to 75% because there is this gap between the transparencies of the different models you get in a single run, and something similar with adult. So even if uh, the CRL gives you more control because it gives you not one, but multiple hybrid models, <coughs> multiple trade-offs, there's still gaps in the fact that you cannot get exactly the transparency that you want. So now given these uh, issues, let's try to motivate a new approach. The problems with hybrid rule set and CRL is that the local search method is stochastic, it's subject to instability, and moreover, it's hard to control the, the, the level of transparency. So we don't respect the criteria that we have for learning uh, um, uh, hybrid models. To solve these issues, we're going to use a method that is called CORELT. It's, uh, it stands for certifi um, Certifiable Optimal Rule Lists. And it's a branch and valid algorithm that was proposed to learn rule lists. And it, 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 it leverages um, a very Im efficient uh, implementation using a permutation invariant data structures. And also it uses a, a, um, a tight, um, lower bounds on the error to prune the search space during the, uh, the branch and bound algorithm. And wh what is also interesting about this method is that it's uh, highly customizable and we can add a constraint on the transparency. Let's say we define SR as the set of all instances that land in the region defined by the rule list and we can enforce during the, the, the branch and bound, can enforce to only keep the solutions that respect the transparency constraint. Let's say we want transparency more or equal than 25% or 50%. Now the first method we propose is, is still in the post black box paradigm. It's called hybrid corels post. You start with a black box and then you minimize this quantity. So you want to find the rule that minimizes the objective we had before. 
And now the error rate can be decomposed into two terms. You have the error that the rule makes on its support, and you have the errors that are made by the black box on the other instances. But since you already know the black box, these two terms in the, uh, mass in the error rate, you can compute them given any rules. And the, the other terms, such as the untransparency and the length of the rule, are also easy to handle. And now, the new thing is that using hybrid curl, we can also do the first implementation of the pre black box paradigm, which was not explored by the two previous methods, so the hybrid rule set and the CRL. But now we have to change the objective because we don't know the black box in advance. We first start to find a region where we can fit a, a rule based model that is well performant, but while well respecting the transparency constraints. So we minimize this quantity here. And the most important thing about this quantity is that it's a lower bound on the error that could be made by the best optimal, mo uh, by the best hybrid model given this rule. So before we know the complex model, we're going to find the, the rule that gives us the best possible thing we can do afterwards. And after we have this rule, we're going to train a black box on the instances on the whole data set, but we're going to put more weight on the instances that are not captured by the rule. And we fine tune those weights via cross validation. And these are the results for ACS employer which is a new version of the adult data set where we have around 100,000 instances and you want to predict whether or not someone is employed in the US. We show the trade-offs in accuracy and transparency for the different methods, CRL, hybrid rule set, and the two hybrid corels implementations. What we see here is that we're, in, the, in this case, we dominate the baselines and we really have tight, um, uh, tight trade-offs in uh, terms of accuracy and transparency. And the same thing for the adult income data set. Uh, but here, it, we, not, we don't dominate, but we're at least uh, competitive with the two baselines. And I just want to take the time to stop here and appreciate the fact that we can have about 75% transparency and the performance is exactly the same. Like it's, it doesn't go down from the beginning. We have this sort of elbow where the performance is stable and then it goes down. And to me, this is very encouraging because it means that our black boxes, they're good, they're globally good, but they may be overkill on like 75% of your data, you don't need it but you need your black box on the other 25%. So th this to me is the most in, like exciting result about hybrid models is the fact that maybe we can, maybe we don't need the black boxes or fully the black boxes. Maybe we can have like a, a half step towards certification because we can at least certify that the model is going to be interpretable on 50% of your data or in that case, 75% of your data. And for Compass, which is a smart data set, we see an even more interesting trend is that we improve performance by doing an hybrid modeling. And why is that? My intuition is that the, the fact of taking a complex black box fitted with very few data and just replacing it with a rule on a simple subset of the problem, it acts as, as a regular regularizer. And we, uh, we hypothesize that for small data sets, hybrid modeling can even improve uh, the performance of the model. So not only do you sometimes get the same amount of performance, you can even improve. And for uh, Compass, this is the, the model that we had the mon with optimal performance. It's an hybrid model where the complex part is a random forest. And we only have three rows on top that involve age and prior crimes. And this model is more accurate than the black box. So to conclude, your black box is very good, but maybe overkill on a certain subset of your data. And what is cool is that you can potentially replace it by an interpretable model on that subset. You retain the same level, the same level of performance, but you're partially transparent, so you can start to understand a bit more your model and have more guarantees about it. And also, we, uh, by leveraging hybrid Corel, the new um, a novel approach for hybrid modeling, we're able to obtain state-of-the-art results, and we have uh, guarantees on transparency and also optimality of the, of the rules that we obtain. And future work, it regards, we want also to ta tackle regression tasks, because uh, many of our uh, in industrial partners, they use regression data sets. And moreover, the since these are new types of models, there are so novel challenges in fairness that are involved, especially by the fact that when you have a point, you can send this person either to the complex part or the simple part, and there is, it's better to be sent to the interpretable part because you know how the prediction was made, and there's, it's not good to be sent to the black box, so there are new notions of fairness that are introduced. And moreover, I want to know the impact on algorithmic recourse. So if you have a prediction that is bad for you, maybe if you have an hybrid model, then you can, it can help you improve your score because you know that if you do the changes required to go inside the one of the if statements, then you know the prediction is guaranteed to go toward what you want. So yeah, thank you very much for your time and I'm looking forward to answering your questions.
you, Gabriel. Thanks a lot. Um, any questions for Gabriel? Yep. Hey, thanks for the great talk. Uh, quick question. The Compass and Adult data set are somewhat imbalanced, right? Have you perhaps looked at uh, whether or not your explanations are more likely to apply on the majority or minority class or any other interesting observations in that direction? Well, that study, um, can you repeat that? What is it about those, those data sets? You mean the imbalance? The, the data sets the are imbalanced, right? In terms of the labels? Yes. Yeah. And are there um, are bigger portions of the ma ma majority or minority kind of label classes mm -hmm. explained by the simple part of your model, or have you made any observations in this direction? Do the minority class tend to be harder to get, mm -hmm. right? Or yeah, I have not, but I'm pretty sure there is, so I should look back, but I'm sure, like, the rules are going to be lazy. They're going to try to classify the easiest parts, and it's easier to classify the majority. So I would expect them to classify the majority. Maybe there's a way to add some more constraints, but I expect them to classify the majority. Unless maybe you can force it to be the label. Maybe you can force the rules to only predict the label one. I'm sure. Yes. So I had a similar question. Is there some kind of risk that if your data set is biased, that the rules that you learn are going to reinforce the biases in your data set? I mean, obviously, this is also a problem with black box models, but what do you think? Yep. Um, I know that the future di direction of this work is to introduce notions of fairness, like predictive fairness, so make sure that the, the outcomes between subgroups are equal, but now there's also new notions of fairness that, that involve, if you're from different subgroups in the data, you want always to descend to the interpretable part. So it's even harder because now there's going to be multiple notions of fairness that, will that we need to balance with each other when we use this model. But of course, there's going to be the like classical notions of fairness that are, there are going to be issues with this, and that there are issues with the compass and adult data set currently. A lot of questions. <laughs> yeah. Sebastian, you want to go ahead? Yeah, so just a question. Did you look on the stability of, of the approach? Like if you remove one point and you retrain, do you get the same kind of model or does it change a lot? We didn't do stability with respect to perturbations of the data. But like on small data sets, like I, I say we train to optimality. This is possible for data sets such, such as Compass with small uh, number of samples. Here, since you train to optimality, at least with respect to the, the, the reruns, you're stable. But I would expect also to be stable with one, let's say, one sample that you remove, because I think rules, by definitions, they are they should be stable because they they are based, they are, they are required to have large support. Like the rules that we use are, we have constraints on the support that they need. So I think removing one instance is not going to change the rules. But um, on larger data sets, just as uh, ACS employee, we don't train to optimality because it. It's very efficient, but it's not actually optimal. So even there, we have still some instability. But at least we can always guarantee that we have the transparency that you need. This is more like the, gu the, gu the guarantee that we can always have. But yeah, we still have some instability with respect to the, the model itself. Uh, oh, yeah, the black box. The black box part might be more unstable than the interpretable part. Yeah, well, uh, I, think, I think they tend to be, in general, more uh, the more complex the model, the more ways you can find to, to solve the same problem, but having different uh, behaviors. So I would expect the black box to be more stable. But here it's like, let's say you have your black box already, or your company, you have your black box, it's already in use, but you want to like uh, respect new requirements, then it's just, oh, you add this interpretable layer on top. So maybe in that case, you don't need to worry about stability, but more, gener more generally, you need to. Okay, so Sandrine, you want to go ahead? Yeah. Um. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. A lot of questions. Um, we can take. Yeah. Go ahead, Sandrine. Okay. Thank you. Um, so this um, transparency metric only works with hybrid models because it's the rate of examples that get sent to the transparent part. Um, do you have any ideas of other transparency metric that could be used to solve this ranking problem of all the interpretable algorithms? Yeah. Because the, the figures you showed at the beginning, it's a ranking that's very subjective for everyone. Yeah, it's also subjective because even if we say we have a transparent model, it might not be in practice. If you have a linear model, it also depends on the sparsity of the model. If it uses all the features, then it's not interpretable. If, here, if I use transparency, I can perhaps say it's transparent because you see the model, but it's not interpretable because it's not simple. So I, I think, like even if I say it's uh, transparent, doesn't mean it's fully interpretable. 
but this is more complex because now we have different types of classes and it's hard to, now you know, need to go into cognitive science to know where, at which point does my model become interpretable or not. But here it's like, I, it's the only way I see currently to have at least some quantitative measure uh, and, we, and we see the trade-off and maybe this gives us a more strong intuition for now cases where you would have different models and not just stick to hybrid modeling. Uh, last short question. <laughs> go. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, th thanks for the talk. Uh, any? Do you foresee any difficulties if you uh, go higher in uh, the dimensionality of the inputs? Yeah. Um, well, here the key is that corels. The way it works is that you need to predefine a set of rules, and the scalability is with, it, it is with respect to those rules. So, in a way, you binarize your data set. So, if you increase the di dimensionality, as long as you can have good sets of rules that scale well, so you don't have too many rules, then it can work well. But it's a matter of, I would assume that higher dimensionality, then it gets, it's harder to get, uh, to get my meaningful rules. But I think it's, this is very hard to, like, to measure, but this is where I think the difficulty would come. And so finding predictive rules that have a large support on your data, this is going to be a challenge. Interesting. Well, I see there were more questions, but uh, I encourage you to keep them. Try to <laughs> Uh, don't don't forget about your questions. We'll, we can come back to them uh, after the next talk for the little discussion. We can take questions at that time. So th thanks again, Gabriel. Have a nice talk. Thanks.